Hello everyone, back to today's second video, we're doing Gals Web with Sunday Roundup for today's second video. So this is going to be your usual Sunday after an eclectic mix of this and that. Going to be looking for things like sea surface temperature anomalies, ENSO, solar activity, uh, Arctic Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation, and the weather next week, 10 days as well. Looks like things are going to be getting colder as we move into the beginning of March. There may be a little bit of wintry potential coming up uh, as well. So I wouldn't totally rule out the chance of some snow as we get through to the beginning of March for some parts of the country, but more about that later on in the video. Just to say that the first video release day was the seventh and final spring 2020 analogs update. Uh, loads of analogs, including that one. It's a bit of a bumper addition to sign off with, and uh, of course, that's head of the spring forecast being released. Uh, on Sunday, a week today, 1st of March, we'll release the spring forecast uh, then. So I've um, got a season one around it on Saturday before that. But uh, yeah, we're pretty much at the end now of the spring update. So have a look at that when you've done... Uh, with this video, it'll be placed on the Spring Updates page, uh, hopefully tonight. I may have to uh, put it on the Spring Updates page tomorrow. Very busy day today, but uh, I'll get onto the Spring Updates page either tonight or tomorrow with a written summary going over everything that we discuss in the video. Um, also, this afternoon, later on, we're going to have uh, the ECMDF Measure France and DWD Long Range update tonight on Sobble's Watch. So, a lot going on. Uh, and I think on Sobble's Watch, it's going to be a pretty interesting view, actually, given that we are hinting, anyway, at going rather cold as we move into the beginning of March. But anyway, we'll have a look at that in on Sobble's Watch this evening. So, loads of updates. Do keep checking back to all of them. Don't forget to like the video. So, there's know that you're enjoying um tell us in the comments um if you're enjoying the videos as well don't forget to subscribe to the youtube channel uh and that's absolutely great thanks to everybody for doing that Right, so we'll begin, uh, Gals, with Sunday Roundup with sea surface temperature anomalies today, I think. So this is how the oceans were looking this time last week. We did last week's Sunday Roundup. Got our three areas of interest. Got the Enso region uh, just here. Equatorial Pacific Ocean. Got North Pacific up there. Got the Atlantic over there. That's how things were looking when we did last week's Gals, Weather with Sunday Roundup. Let's have a look at the very latest. And this is it. This is the latest for the 20th of February. So dealing with the Enso region, first of all, again, let's go back to last week. So again, that's how things were looking in the Enso region uh, when we did last week's Gals, Weather with Sunday Roundup. Around Enso neutral, some areas a bit warmer than uh, average, some areas a little bit cooler than average, but overall very close to so neutral. Going back to this week, again, very little change over the past week. We remain at ENSO neutral through the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Remember, we're looking at the CISA temperature anomalies between Peru uh, over here in South America and Indonesia over there and um, when we're warmer than average we're in an El Nino, when we're cold than average we're in a La Nina. So what I've actually got at the moment is neither particularly warm or cold. We're round in so neutral. There's a cooler area just here. Uh, it's a bit warmer over here. Generally uh, we're around and so neutral as we have been throughout this winter. <coughs> Excuse me. Going further south into the um, southern Pacific Ocean though we have got this expanding area of cold of average sea surface temperature not is sitting to the south of the equatorial pacific ocean that's expanding and uh, i think it has intensified a little bit over the past week again if we go back to last week that's how things look last week this is how things look this week i think definitely this cold of an average area sea surface temperature anomalies is expanding also to the north of the pacific ocean up here things are going a little bit colder as well going back to last Last week, again, that's how things looked in the Northern Pacific. Last week, this is how things look now. So around here, I think the um, sea surface temperature is getting colder as well. Northern parts of the Pacific Ocean, the far north, up towards Alaska, it's getting a little bit cold there as well. So overall, the Pacific does seem to be in a rather colder state than it has been for uh, for a few years uh this could be starting to move towards a cold event towards a landing you're setting up for the summer but it's a little bit early to say that with any uh sort of confidence we need to see where the sea surface temperature anomalies are going over the next couple of months i think but definitely at the moment the pacific uh, both the northern pacific and the southern pacific interestingly 
in a rather colder state than we've seen for a little while. Over in the North Atlantic, things remain very similar to uh, how they were last week. So again, that situation last week. This is the situation this week. This cold and average area of sea surface temperature, uh, temperature anomalies in the Northern Atlantic has um, deepened and expanded. So we still have that uh, signature quite cold in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. Still uh, much warmer than average, exceptionally so off the coast of Africa. That's going to be relatively shallow waters. But uh, down in the tropical Atlantic towards Africa, um, it's quite a bit warmer than average uh, there. Then we have this sort of little area of cooler than average just here. It's rather an unusual pattern that we've got in the Atlantic at the moment. But it's all indicative of a positive NAO type pattern when we have this colder than average area just here. Uh, that's going to be indicative of driving in low pressure and westerly winds overall. So uh, we need to see what's happening with this warmer than average area just here. Though. If that starts to extend, extend out through the tropical Atlantic, if all of this area, let's get rid of, get rid of that, if all of this area uh, just here goes warmer than average as we go into the summer, so if these warmer than average areas of sea surface temperature always expand from Africa across the tropical uh, Atlantic, then um, that could be in inducive towards a more active hurricane season So in, uh, in the summer. So we need to see what's happening uh, with those. But at the moment, um, overall, the Atlantic is just still very much primed towards westerlies and low pressure. It's no surprise that we've had such a west the Atlantic driven with winter given that uh, sea surface temperature anomaly profile that we have had in the North Atlantic. Uh, Southern Oscillation Index is uh, looking like this. Uh, this is from Queensland Government, which is part of uh, the Bureau of Meteorology. Southern Oscillation Index is just an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state. It's not driving anything it's in its own terms. It just tells us what the atmosphere is uh, doing. So uh, when the SOI is in its negative phase, we're going to have uh, an El Nino type atmospheric state. When the SOI is in a positive phase, we're going to have a La Nina type atmospheric state. It's measuring the air pressure between Darwin and Tahiti. So if we scroll down and have a look at our daily uh, returns, you can see that a few days ago, we went very negative actually uh, with the SOI. So these are our air pressures uh, just here and here in these two columns. And then this is the overall um, SOI number that we have here. And for the 15th of February, for example, very negative, minus 21.95. That's an atmospheric setup that's strongly reflective of El Nino. 16th of February, again, minus 18.20. 17th of February, minus 18.06. 18th of February, minus 18.16. These are all numbers that are reflective of an El Nino type state. Uh, but as we go to more recent days, 20th of February comes out at plus 4.42, 21st of February at plus 10.71, 22nd of February at plus 6.10, and the latest uh, number that we've got for the 23rd of February, that ahead of us, of course, in Australia, is uh, plus 5.14. That's more reflective of a La Nina type state. And it's been going on throughout the winter trading, uh, negative SOI numbers and positive SY numbers, which means that the atmosphere has been swinging between El Nino type state and La Nina type state. And when that happens, what you end up with is, as each state sort of offsets one another, you end up at Enso neutral. And that's exactly where we have been through this winter at Enso neutral. And we remain at Enso neutral too. The red line is the 30 uh, day SOI average. You can see that it went quite positive, actually, or slightly positive uh, towards the end of January, then fell back into negative territory. Not strongly negative, though. Where we currently are with the 30 day average is is somewhere between minus two and minus three in terms of the 30 day SY average around Enso neutral, uh, really, neither in an El Nino or a La Nina type state. CFSV2 is still forecasting us to go into a uh, La Nina through this summer and into the autumn. So we've got our temperature anomalies on the side of the chart here, dates in monthly periods along the bottom. 
uh, the black line, black dash line, I should say, is the uh, ensemble mean. Each other coloured line, the red and blue lines, they are the individual members of the CFS ensemble suite. Uh, so at the moment, we're around here, so around Enzo Neutral, just into sort of borderline weak El Nino territory. Remember, the all important numbers are 0 0.5, either above or below average. To reach El Nino threshold, you need to be 0 0.5 or more, half a degree or more above average. To reach a your threshold, you need to be 0 0.5 half a degree below average and you need to do that over five tri-monthly periods as well so there is quite strict criteria about getting either an El Nino or a La Nina designated uh, anyway where we are right now is somewhere on the border between sort of Enso neutral and slight El Nino but by the time you get through to April just there uh, the CFS uh, the CFS uh, ensemble mean has us sort of backed into into neutral condition by the time you get through to July actually we're going into a La Nina that's quite a rapid transition from where we are right now sort of borderline El Nino to, uh, to Enso neutral into a weak La Nina uh, within sort of a, uh, two or three months so uh, quite a quick transition uh, into a weak La Nina by July, and then beyond that, the CFS has, on top of me, has things trending down further, uh, reaching moderate La Nina threshold, actually, minus 1.5, reaching moderate La Nina threshold by October and November. There is quite a bit of scatter within there, so we've got uh, a few ensemble members down here, these blue ones down here, that are going for a very strong La Nina event. Obviously, they're outliers, but uh, they're going for a really, really strong card event. Conversely, though, these ones up here... These lines that have got up here are keeping things around Enso neutral uh, through the summer. So there is a bit of scatter, but overall you can clearly see that the CFS is uh, still keen to set up a La Nina. And quite a quick sort of transition into this La Nina through the late spring and early summer as well. Uh, so for summer, La Nina, if, it, if it's quite strong and if it transitions quickly, that could be bad news uh, for summer. 1997 did that, uh, not 1997, 2007, I should say, did a very quick transition into, uh, into a moderate La Nina through that summer. And uh, it was one of the factors probably that, uh, that uh, happened to cause that very, very wet summer that we had in 2007. However, if it's just a slow transition into a weak La Nina, something that we have, for example, in 1995, then that won't be particularly impactful on the summer at all. So we just need to keep an eye on this and see how quickly this transition into La Nina, if we do go into La Nina, is, uh, is happening. This is only one model, of course. Other models are not as keen on uh, setting up a La Nina for this summer. And we're going to talk about this in depth in the ENSO update that we're going to do on Friday. We'll do February's ENSO update on Friday. And we'll get several models together and uh, see what the general consensus is about the prospects of this La Nina then. So more about, uh, about all of this on Friday evening. Uh, moving on to solar activity, so this is how the solar disk is looking on outside of this day from solarham.net. We have a spotless solar disk, no sunspots at all. Uh, solar activity is at uh, very low levels, therefore, because there's no sunspots to be seen. And uh, Soham is reporting that solar activity is expected to remain at very low levels for the next three days at least. Uh, this is showing spotless days uh, by year and the current uh, spotless day stretch. has been sent through by a good friend, Richard Short. Thank you, Richard, for sending this through. So we can see that for 2020 so far, we're still early in the year, of course, but for 2020, we have had 37 days uh, that have been spotless, have had no sunspots at 69% of the year. That average, that uh, percentage, has very uh, quickly shot up over the uh, past uh, couple of weeks. You'll remember that back in January, we did actually have some sunspots, and some of them were for Solar Cycle 24, the Solar Cycle that we're currently leaving. Some of them were for Solar Cycle 25, the upcoming Solar Cycle. There's always an overlap between sunspots from the two Solar Cycles. So uh, back in January, the um, sort of average uh, number of uh, sunspot days was relatively low. But this is going up very, very quickly uh, now as we are still in the depths of uh, solar minimum. Um, 2019 had 77%, 281 days without any sunspots. Deep, deep solar minimum in 2019. Uh, 19. So uh, we can expect this average um, 
uh, this percentage of uh, spotty stays to continue to increase, I think, over certainly the first half of this year. Um, and then in the second half of the year, as we probably go to Sarasota 25 sometime through the summer, I would have thought, maybe a bit earlier than that, maybe a bit later. But through this year, we'll probably go into Sarasota 25. By the end of the year, we'll probably see sunspots beginning to uh, lift up. Though having said that, the last Sarasota was a very, very lift, slow lift up. 2008 was the solar minimum year uh, of solar cycle 23, the last uh, solar minimum that occurred, uh, with 268 days without sunspot, 73% of the year. And 2009 was only just a little bit below that. The first year of solar cycle 24 had 260 days without sunspots, which was 71% of the year. It wasn't really until 2010 that things uh, started to uh, get going with solar cycle 24. So it could be that this year. 2020 if it follows the same path as um follows the same path as the last solar uh, minimum into the new solar cycle it could be that this year has very very low numbers of sunspots as well it won't be until next year that uh, solar activity begins to pick up but anyway we are at a deep solar minimum and we can expect to remain within deep solar minimum for the time being big thank you to richard for sending that through now where are we we are just there so we move on to uh eurasian snow cover this is how things are looking in terms of uh, eurasian snow cover at the moment but again, it looks very, very poor across most parts of Europe. All of the areas that you'd expect to see snow um, in late February are basically snow-free. So, for example, most of Ukraine is snow-free. Much of the Baltic is snow-free as well. We've got parts of Finland just here, but it's snow-free. Um, uh, many southern parts of Sweden are snow-free. Uh, and even into western parts of Russia, actually. Western Russia has become snow free as well over the past uh, few days but the extreme west of russia i suppose i should say we do have snow over mountainous areas so if you're off to the alps you will still be able to find some snow there if you go high enough up anyway um but it's a very very poor season this for uh, for snow cover However, we may see um, increasing snow cover as we go into the final days of February and the early days of March, not just in the UK, but across some parts of Europe as well. So we could start to make up deficit a little bit. Obviously, we won't be able to make up the overall seasonal deficit as we are nearly at the end of this winter. But we may start to see improvements with snow cover across uh, some parts of Europe uh, over the um over the next uh, week or two. We'll have to wait and see about that, of course. Most parts of Russia are covered uh, with snow, as you would expect, away from the extreme west. And all of this yellow up here, this is where we've got Arctic sea ice. So we have got pretty decent amounts of Arctic sea ice. Not sure it's all that thick, but we have got pretty decent amounts of uh, Arctic sea ice as a result of this extremely uh, zonal winter which has kept a lot of the cold air bottled up within the arctic and polar regions this is actually showing uh, arctic sea ice extent uh, for this season that's the blue line uh, just there so um we have dropped that down a little bit over the past few days that's been our most recent peak just there we sort of leveled it off and dropped it down a little bit over the past few days but if i compare we compare that to uh, recent averages so we've got the 2011 to 2019 average just there that's this second blue line you can see we're still above that so we're still doing better in terms of arctic size extent remember this doesn't look at um ice thickness just looking at ice extent so for ice extent we are still above the 2011 to 2019 average that's this year that's 2011 to 2019 average so we're above that we're doing better than the most recent average if we put in the 20 uh, 2001 to 2010 average we did um reach parity with that uh, around a week ago you remember we've dropped it down a little bit though since then so we're now slightly under the uh 2001 to 2010 average not far from it but we're slightly under it uh and of course then the more um the, the more um further back we go uh, the more ice we get so we go to the 1991 to 2010 average that's the green line and we're well below that as you would expect and we're also even further below the 1979 to 1990 average that's that orange line 
uh, just there. So we have to put this in context. Yes, we've done a little bit better for Arctic size extent for this season. We're still above our most recent 10-year average, 2011 to 2019. Uh, we've fallen a bit behind 2001 to 2010, not all that far from it, but we are way below the 1991 to 2000 and 1979 to 1990 average, as, of course, you expect after so many years of... Um, uh, drastic sort of uh, Arctic sea ice melting that we've had over the past 10 to uh, 15 years or so. But again, let's just say we are doing a little bit better for Arctic sea ice extinct for this season. Uh, now, this is showing the QBO. This is from uh, NASA, so I thought I'd just throw this in. We'll be getting February's QBO number at the beginning of March. We're still struggling to hawk this easterly QBO up, however. You'll remember we are going into the easterly phase of the QBO, the quasi biennial oscillation. So, uh, it's just an index again that's reflecting the atmospheric state. This time, talking about the strength of the zonal winds. So, when you're in a West Sea QBO, zonal winds will be strengthened. When you're in an East Sea QBO, uh, zonal winds will be weakened. It's, uh, it's a very regular cycle from West Sea to East Sea, back to West Sea, back to East Sea. It should be like a pulse. It should be very consistent and... Um, does go awry occasionally, but the QBO should be very, very consistent. The current phase that we're in with the QBO is uh, easterly QBO descending. So with this, you have to think that this is the top of the atmosphere just here. That's the stratosphere, 10 HPA. This is like the surface. And the boundary level of the atmosphere where weather takes place, the troposphere, is between 30 and 50 HPA. Now, you, you can see, actually, the last easterly QBO phase that happened um, from 2017 to 2018 and that's this blue, greeny coloured area just here. And then the most recent Wesley QBO is this sandy coloured area just here. So you'll see how the last west to east transition phase of the QBO happened very easily. Notice how these blue and green colours just descend very easily down through the boundary levels of the atmosphere, reaching the troposphere around there sometime in the summer of 2017. And then we go into the Eastly QBO, which lasts through the rest of 2017 into the first half of, uh, two, or most of 2018. Wesley QBO, again, same idea. It descends very easily late in 2018. And there we are through 2019. We're in a Wesley QBO. Where we are right now is the Eastly QBO is descending. We've got these green and blue colours up here, but it's not descending easily. It's not doing it anywhere near as easily and straightforwardly as the last Eastly QBO phase descended. So if I zoom in, let's uh, close in on this chart, you'll see that, yes, uh, at the top levels of the atmosphere, we've got those blue and green colours. That's the Eastly QBO sitting in the top part of the atmosphere. Also got a little bit um, uh, just here. Uh, so around sort of 40 HPA to 50 HPA, we've got some EC, the ECQBO is there. But you see we've got these raggedy looking uh, sandy coloured area, brown coloured area still continuing along this dash line just here, which is, uh, which is 30 HPA. Uh, and that's just the West QBO refusing to die, if you like. That just is clinging on by its fingertips. And um, the East QBO is not descending easily into the 30 to 15 HPA level. Now, I've, I think we are going to get this East QBO go. It's just taking quite a while to do it. But I don't think it's going to be much longer before we go definitively into the EC phase of the QBO. I suspect it will happen through the spring. We are transitioning into it, but it's a very, very slow, uh, very slow transition. Uh, this. I don't think we'll see a failure of the EC QBO. I think the EC QBO is too far entrenched within the atmosphere to see a failure of the easy QBO. We had that in 2016 when we had the Super Nino had a failure of the easy QBO, which was very, very unusual. I say QBO should be like a pulse and a heartbeat. It should be very, very regular uh, cycle between West and East QBO. As far as we know, when we had the failure of the East QBO in 2016, that was the first time that had happened. I don't think that will happen again. I think we will see these green and blue colours, the East QBO, definitively pushing into the troposphere 
uh, within the next few weeks and months. But it's very, very slow. It's taken a long time to do it. And at the moment, this Westy Cube, you know, just sort of clings on by its fingertips. These brown areas are gradually getting more and more raggedy. So they are going to go, I think, before too much longer. And then we will go definitively into the uh, easterly phase of the Cube. You know, next winter, 2020-2021, should be an easterly Cube you know, winter, possibly quite a strong easterly cubio winter um uh, and so that will favor but not guarantee it will favor a rather colder winter next time arctic oscillation observed and forecast all night that set a new record a uh, new daily record uh for the arctic oscillation so the black line shows where we've been with the ao red lines at the end where the gfs ensembles are forecasting the arctic oscillation to go it's an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state over the arctic so when the arctic oscillation is in its negative phase you're going to have high pressure have blocking over the pole and the Arctic. When the AO is in its positive phase, you've got low pressure up over the pole. That keeps the cold air bottled in over the pole. And that's exactly what we've had uh, through this uh, winter. We've had a very strongly positive Arctic oscillation pretty much throughout the whole of winter, although it did go slightly negative there in the second half of December. But other than that, the AO has been in very, very solidly positive territory throughout the whole of the winter. Uh, and it remains extremely positive. In fact, uh, just yesterday, or the day before, I think we reached a new record for the uh, Arctic Oscillation, beating the previous record, which was set just a few days before that, back in the earlier part of February. So we've been getting these peaks within the AO. The first one happened just there, uh, around the middle of January. We didn't think the AO could go any higher than that, really. But yes, we went higher than that in the first half of February with that peak just there. And then we've gone even, at that point, we didn't think the AO would go any higher. Uh, to, uh, but uh, over the past couple of days, the AO has gone even higher. It's gone up the scale uh, again. So we are breaking records left, right and centre with this winter for the Arctic Oscillation. It can't remain at that level for very long. So what's going to happen is that over the next few days, the AO will do a bit of a plummet, actually. That is quite a, uh, quite a plummet. Still, though, um, even when it bottoms out, uh, as we get towards the end of uh, February just here, still in positive territory, and that's like solidly positive AO territory, really. It's just not exceptionally or record-breakingly positive. And the GFS ensembles are keeping the AO in positive territory through to the early part of March as well. It tells us that from an Arctic perspective, we remain devoid of northern blocking as we have been throughout this season. We're going to keep more low pressure going up over the Arctic and over the North Pole. So broadly, from an Arctic perspective, this um, this zonal winter continues. One change is with the NAO, though. So again, this is an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state, not driving anything, just tells what the atmosphere is doing. When the, uh, the black line shows where I've been with the NAO, red lines at the end where the GFS ensemble is forecasting the NAO to go. When the NAO is in its positive phase, you are uh, you have uh, high pressure in the Azores and low pressure around ice as you strength west is, particularly if it's combined with a positive AO as it has been through this winter. And a zonal westerly flow in winter is going to be mild, so that's the reason we have had such an exceptionally mild winter. Where we are right now with the NAO is uh, is positive. So, yes, um, quite strongly positive with the uh, NAO. But you'll notice as we go towards the end of February and the beginning of March, the GFS ensembles are moving the NAO down to neutral. Uh, it's... Uh, very subtle change. We're not going negative with the NEO, so we're not replacing the low pressure around ISO with high pressure and high pressure around the Azores with low pressure. We're not having a flip on the pattern as you would get in a negative NEO. Nevertheless, it is a bit of a change and it possibly allows something a little bit colder to begin to move in uh, to northern parts of Europe as we get through to the end of February and the beginning of March. While still driving in from the Atlantic, still Atlantic base, Atlantic driven, we could be on the cusp of something. Just just a little bit colder and um, perhaps a little bit more in way of wintry weather as we go through to the end of February and the beginning of March. So that's the reason I said we may see snow cover beginning to improve a little bit across some parts of northern Europe in the next few uh, days, the next couple of weeks. 
These are the GFS operator temperature and precipitation ensembles for the next couple of weeks. We're going to Exeter, uh, home of UK Met Office today. The red line is 30-year upper air temperature average for Exeter. We're still very mild at the moment and will remain very mild for the next uh, day or so. But we do see signs that the temperatures are dropping as we go into the early to mid part of this week. Then they tick up a bit later in the week before they drop again. Overall, <coughs> excuse me, overall it looks as though late February and through the first week of March, March could now be trending rather colder than average. I think overall we are slightly colder than average there, which is a place we haven't been very often with these ensemble grass over the past um, over the past few months during this winter. So yes, quite a quite a change actually that compared to what we've seen with these ensembles, upper air temperature ensembles over this uh, winter. A little bit colder than average overall and still loads of precipitation. That remains the big story really. Just regular rainfall spikes from the beginning to end. This is for Exeter, so it's exposed to the Atlantic, of course, down in the southwest of England. But nevertheless, it's indicative of the fact that even into the first week of March, we're likely to keep things very unsettled. And with the air getting colder, that's how the wintry potential is growing, perhaps, uh, as well. Temperature anomaly is showing something that we haven't seen for a very, very long time. This is a temperature anomaly from the 23rd of February to 2nd of March. It's below average. A cold of an average week is being forecast pretty much through the whole of the UK and Ireland. That's very, very, uh, very rare for this winter. We haven't seen that for a really long time. Also, large parts of Scandinavia looking quite a lot cold as well in the week ahead. So, definite change there. Uh, compared to what we've seen through most of this winter. Precipitation-wise, for 23rd of February to 2nd of March, it uh, remains uh, unsettled. Above average precipitation, with temperatures going colder than average, increasing wintry potential. Changes for America as well. The temperature anomaly from the 23rd of February to 2nd of March for Eastern America is also colder than average. Again, that is something we haven't seen very often through this winter. They've had a really mild winter in the eastern part of the states, but all change there as well. Going colder than average in the east of America this week uh, or in the next week. Out in the west, it does look quite a bit warmer precipitation-wise for America. Looks like that. Most of the states are quite dry. This was the midnight run of the GFS and bringing in a cold, showery northwesterly wind on Wednesday. Then low pressure moves in from off the Atlantic on Thursday. The exact track of that will determine where any rain or snow divide happens to be. Another low pressure takes a southerly track into Sunday. That low pressure pushes across England and Wales. Again, there could be rain or snow associated with that. And as the low pressure clears out into the North Sea, pulls in quite a cold northerly wind. So this is how things look on the 1st of March, certainly the 1st of March, a week away with the midnight GFS run. A cold northerly wind gives us a cold start to the spring of uh, 2020. Won't be as cold as uh, a couple of years ago, though, when we had the beach from the east uh, for the beginning of March, of course. Um, then we go up towards day 10. And we bring more low pressure off the Atlantic. This one, again, this low just here at day 10, which is Wednesday, the 4th of March. That's taking a southerly track. So rain, snow, possible with that. It's all very marginal. Some places will get rain. Some places will get snow. Uh, and where the divide between rain and snow is uh, won't be known until much closer to the time frame. And then we go back into those quite cold and showery northwesterly winds as we move into extended range with the midnight GFS run. That's how we look as we end it. So by then, just starting to ridge up a little bit of high pressure from the southwest. But even then, still probably quite chilly. That's up to the 10th of March. So the first 10 days of March could well be coming out colder than average, uh, if that's right. While we've been talking, the 6 o'clock GFS run has been updating. Wednesday, again, cold, showery, northwesterly winds and low pressure coming in on Thursday. But low pressure trending a bit further southwards for Thursday uh, uh, with this GFS run. Remember, it's on the northern edge of the low that will have the greatest risk of snow. So the exact track of that low needs to be determined. 
into Friday, we're into um, the weekend, we stay cold and unsettled, low pressure driving in from the northwest, so rain, sleet, snow possible through to next weekend. Uh, that's how things look in a week's time, not quite as much of a northerly as the midnight GFS run was showing, but still bringing in uh, quite cold air from the north uh, on Sunday next week. Up to day 10, low pressure is driving in from off the Atlantic, so uh, it's trying to turn things milder, this uh, 6 o'clock GFS run. And that's how it goes into extended range with the 6 o'clock GFS run. Uh, so, again, bringing in um, westerly winds. <coughs> Excuse me, again, trying to build up some high pressure to our south as well. That's a milder option with the 6 o'clock GFS run. GM looks like that. Cold showery northwesterly is on Wednesday. Then low pressure coming in through Thursday and Friday. Again, we need to pin down the detail on the exact track of that low pressure. Into next weekend, again, looks unsettled and potentially quite cold. Rain, sleet, snow, definitely a possibility next weekend then we're into those westerly winds as we move up towards day 10 that's how look as we get to day 10 unsettled winds are coming in from the west to slightly northwest rather chilly quite cold really and still quite showery the jet stream's moving south as well we talked about this in yesterday's video the black line is a jet stream that's shifting southwards in towards Biscay and northern parts of Spain. ECM, again, cold and showery northwesterly winds on uh, Wednesday. Then low pressure comes in from the Atlantic through Thursday and Friday. Much further north with this low pressure with the ECM, though. Into the weekend, again, quite cold and showery with uh, northwest wind detail on all of that to be determined. In towards day 10, the ECM is trying to build up high pressure over Scandinavia, so that's something different that the other two models aren't really showing, but it is trying to have a go at building a Scandinavian high and uh, pushing the jet stream in these areas of low pressure southeastwards. That is just about on the cusp of bringing a very cold easterly wind. There's the upper air temperatures at day 10, Wednesday the 4th of March. March and we've got a deep cold pool sitting over Scandinavia so obviously that is quite close to bringing in pretty cold east winds. Things definitely more, looking more interesting for the end of February and the beginning of March from a wintry perspective compared to this, uh, to, compared to this winter so far definitely. Uh, this is the precipitation forecast based on that ECM run from Tomecho.com. So showers uh, and long spells rain clearing away today. Then tonight we're bringing in an area of strong winds and heavy rain with snow uh, to northern half of the country. Snow watch yesterday looking at that. Scotland down to northeastern England looks like it has the greatest risk of snow uh, overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning. Rain further south that pushes away and leaves us with cold and showery northwest winds for Tuesday and for Wednesday as well. Then this low pressure is coming in through Thursday and into Friday. That brings snow to the north and uh, not too much rain down to the south. Turns very wet there though on the 28th of February. That's uh, Friday. Very wet across England and Wales. And then over the weekend we've got rain, sleet, snow uh, around the country. Again, detail on that all to be determined. Heading up towards day 10, uh, we keep things quite unsettled, particularly in the west. Remember, the ECM is also building that high pressure over Scandinavia, or trying to, as we get towards day 10. And we have this band of rain coming in from the west, bumping into the cold air that's already been starting to be dragged in from the east. And so the ECM does produce a snow event there around the 3rd of March across many parts of the country. Whether that will actually come to anything remains to be seen. These are the options on the table in the ECM was almost today for day 10 uh, which is the 4th of March so we have 19 members of the ECM ensembles bringing in a lot of low pressure very unsettled at uh, day 10 uh, with that one pretty chilly too winds are lining up northwest southeast we're on the cold side of the jet there 18 including the uh, ECM control and operational runs again low pressure is across northwest parts of uh, Europe and 14 again has us under low pressure all rows leading to unsettled and quite cold conditions for the early part of March. In two weeks' time, these are the options that we got. That size of a change, as there's quite a lot of options. This is for the 9th of March. 20, um, we have 11 members of the ECM ensembles with high pressure to the south, low pressure to the north. Still a bit, still a bit unsettled and milder. 
10 with a trough of low pressure to our east, unsettled and cold, bringing winds from the north. Another 10 with high pressure setting up to our north, high pressure between Iceland and Scandinavia, low pressure to our south. That would bring in an easterly wind. That's turning us into an easy. Presumably the Scandinavian high uh, takes over there on those 10. Uh, 8 with low pressure to our east, high pressure out to the west. Quite showery and relatively cold. Six with a Scandinavian high. Let's change the colour. Six with a Scandinavian high. Bring in easterly winds. They're going to be quite cold. And then another six with high pressure just out to the northwest. Perhaps bringing in more of a north northeasterly. So a lot of options on the table as we get through to the second week of March. We could be seeing signs of high pressure developing as you get towards the second week of March, which would settle us down. The exact position of the high pressure would determine whether it's a cold ridge uh, or whether it's a uh, whether it brings spring-like uh, weather. But maybe hints and signs of a change for the second week of March. Finally, the CFS V2 means the 500 millibar heights breaking down to week peers. The first week period takes us from the 23rd to 29th of February. The coming week with low pressure to the north, high pressure to the south, southwest, unsettled and getting colder as winds swing in from the north and that carries on into week two as well the first of the seventh of march again low pressure to our north but also digging into northern europe which is something we haven't had all that often this winter high pressure again out to the southwest jet stream is lined up northwest to southeast unsettled and potentially quite cold with some wintry potential there through the first week of March. All change for week three. It's the 8th to the 14th of March. Above average heights, high pressure then builds up from the south and takes over across much of Europe. Low pressure out to the northwest. That turns us mild and spring-like. The CFS wants to develop this ridge into a spring-like pattern in the second week of March. And that goes on into week four, which is the 15th to 21st of March. High pressure then centred across central parts of Europe brings up very mild air from the south. So the CFS does um, show high pressure taking over as we go through into March, and it's a warm ridge. Finally, March itself is looking like this with the CFS. It's 700 millibar height anomaly. Still going for the same idea, but it has been throughout uh, its forecast this month. High pressure to the south, low pressure to the north. Um, it's a more anti-cyclonic month than we've had, uh, but not without some influence from the Atlantic. And it would be mild as well. Temperature anomalies are forecast to be above average during March. And precipitation anomalies are forecast to be average to hinting at being a little bit wetter than average. So definite signs of higher pressure building as we go through to March. But the exact position of any ridge would be really, really important, of course, to determining how mild or cold it is. Finally, if you've been enjoying the videos just lately, please can consider becoming a patron for Gauss Web. We've got 62 patrons uh, so far. So hello and a big thank you to our 62 patrons. If you'd like to become a patron for Gauss Web and give us an uh, ongoing monthly donation, it should be anything from $1 a month upwards, you can come to the Gauss Web Patreon page. You can sign up for a Patreon account, assuming you don't already have one, and uh, then you can become a patron for Gauss Web. You pull in with all of the other patrons, and uh, thank you so much to everybody for doing that. Thank you so much to all of Gaz Weatherby's uh, patrons. We hope you're enjoying the content that we're producing at the moment, even if this winter was a bit disappointing from a cold perspective. Alternatively, you can become a donor through PayPal. So if you'd like to give a donation to Gaz Weatherby's through PayPal, again, you just come to the Gaz Weatherby's PayPal page. We link to both Patreon and PayPal on all of the pages at gazweatherby's.com and also in the description at YouTube. You just come here, sign into your PayPal account and give whatever donation you would like to Gaz Weathers. And uh, that's absolutely great. Thank you so much to all of our donors and patrons. Uh, you're helping us to pay for the content, you're helping us to keep the website gazweathers.com online and keep the content going. So a big thank you to all of our patrons and a big thank you to all of our donors. Whether you do it through Patreon or PayPal, you get a shout out in videos 
I will say thank you so much for doing that, as long as you want one. Right, so that's it for uh, Gas Army's Silly Roundup for this week. Hope you found it interesting and informative. Don't forget to give the video a like. Let us know in the comments what you thought. And also subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, later on, we're going to have the ECMJ Adventure France and DWD Long Range update. That'll be coming up around 3 for this afternoon. Tonight, we've got Ensemble's Watch. I'll try to get that final Spring Analogues update onto the Spring Updates page this evening with a written summary. If it's not tonight, then it will be tomorrow. But for the Sunday Roundup, that's all for now, and thanks for watching.